OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Well, welcome everyone. It's one o'clock and uh, on our agenda, it's time for the MOU for the AJCCs and we'll get into all those acronyms soon. My counterpart, Catherine Peacock. Catherine, are you unmuted? Uh, not yet. I think you're, you need to unmute. Okay. I think I am now. Unmuted. Okay. And then uh, I'll I'll drive the slide deck. Catherine's going to do the first part. I'm going to do the middle, and uh, and then Catherine will do the uh, last part. And then we'll bring in our panelists. We're already here. We have Marianne Pranky from Glendale Community College, who is co-located at the Verdugo One Stop, and then we have Adele McLean, who's with the Apple Valley Adult School, also connected with her. Uh, local one-stop and uh, local workforce development board. So they will have a nice discussion at the end of this after we go through the slides and you can ask questions and we can have discussion. So we look forward to that and we thank them for coming on today to help us out. Okay, with that. Okay, I guess I'm on. Hi. Yeah, I'm trying to, one second, Catherine. Well, yep. oh, there we go. It's a little delayed on this line. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay, so we're going to go first through the AJCCs, and I'm assuming everyone understands what they what that means. But I'll go over it. It's the American Job Centers of California. Uh, they're centrally located throughout the state of California, and they have a variety of services. So, what is an AJCC exactly? Well, it's a one-stop shop for workforce services. And it provides a comprehensive range of no cost employment and training services for not only students, but for employers and job seekers. Uh, the AJCC is a network of local, state, and private public and public organizations offering a variety of services. They have a very, very cool web website that I would encourage all of you um, to visit. And have your students visit. And I'm sure we'll hear from people about how their students have been visiting from our panelists. Okay, I think I'm ready to go on to the next slide. Okay, there, there are types of AJCCs and one is, a type is the comprehensive. And this provides access to all required American Job Centers of California partner programs. And that includes Title II. Uh, the program services and activities with at least one Title I staff physically present. That, no, that's not exactly true. Sometimes they're present. You have to see if that person is present. Okay, next slide. Okay, and the affiliate. And the affiliate AJCC provides access to one or more AJCC partner programs, services, and activities. For instance, Title II. And the specialized associated with either a comprehensive or an affiliate AJCC and addresses specific needs of dislocated workers, youth, or key industry sectors or clusters. Okay, we can go on to the next one. And how many titles does it include? Well, one, two, three, and four. And we are Adult Education and Family Literacy Act. And that's what we are usually referred to, uh, AEFLA slash Title II. And they have a lot of information on the website that I would really encourage you to, to peruse. I mean, for instance, their newsroom has announcements constantly that are really, really helpful. Okay, move on to the next one. I'm glad this is going very quickly and I can see the slides. Thanks, Neil. Okay, requirements. <laughs> I'm telling you, I had surgery on Monday, so oh, it was iffy. Okay, requirements of an AJCC partners. First, provide access to its programs or activities. Use a portion of its funds to support infrastructure and to provide career services. Enter into a memorandum of understanding, and we'll go through that wonderful piece of literature soon, with the Local Workforce Development Board, or the LWDB. Participate in the operation of the AJCC delivery system consistent with the terms of the MOU. 
and provide representation on the state and local WDBs as required and participate in board committees as needed. Again, you can find a lot of this information on the website. Okay, let's just, now over to you, Neil. Thank All you, right. It's kind of over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. So purposes of the MOU, it's not just because we want to do some paperwork and make your lives miserable. It's actually a requirement of receiving federal funds. The uh, America's Job Centers of California and the local workforce development boards are required to certify their AGCCs every three years. So they're in the process this year. I think it starts in January, 2024, the certification process. So they these are MOUs are very important um, to their system and are required as part of the federal funding. So uh, as it says here, the purpose of the memorandum of understanding is to establish the roles and responsibilities of the local workforce development board, the chief elected officials, and the American Job Centers of California partners, which are adult education um, programs, in relation to the operation of the uh, America's Job Center of California delivery system. So that includes uh, local discussion and negotiation to ensure successful integration and implementation of partner programs, and all required partners must be included in the MOU. So if you if you haven't seen an MOU, you will see um, a lot of language about you know products and services that are required um, in the and we'll get into this. And, and you will also have uh, maybe a an additional uh, MOU or what they call an umbrella that delineates some of those services you're going to provide. And in some cases, the uh, the attachment might include like a spreadsheet or a worksheet that shows the breakdown of maybe referrals or whatever services you're providing or collaborations with your AJCC. So moving on to the next slide, here are some types of MOUs I kind of talked about. There's a separate partner agreement, which where the local workforce development board in agreement with the chief elected official may enter into agreements with each partner or groups of partners. So um, that could consist of an umbrella MOU. The umbrella MOU addresses issues related to the system, its CEO and its all its partners. It also allows partner programs to focus on service delivery. And like I said, that could come in, the, if you're co-located, you could be providing services there. If you're affiliated, you might be provi providing services at your school, uh, but you have this MOU that um, describes that partnership and maybe some referrals that you're going to be doing. Uh, it also facilitates transparency and the flexible agreement. So moving on to the next slide. So major components of a memorandum of understanding are how you share customers, how you share services, and if you are located at the AJCC, how you share costs. So uh, local boards must work with all required partners in their local area to develop an agreement regarding the operations of the local systems. So like when Catherine showed all those titles, you have title one, which is the local workforce development boards and the AJCCs. You have title two, which is us, which we've been talking about all this morning. Carolyn uh, went over the uh, the grant, the we owe a two grant, that's, that's title two. And then title three is the employment development department, uh, what they call employment services that they offer. And that's Wagner Pizer and kind of the labor exchange. So um, that uh, supports Cal jobs. So if you're familiar or if you've heard the, the system Cal jobs, that's where all the job postings um, in the state go up and EDD manages that. And then Title IV, which Catherine mentioned, are rehab services um, and rehab centers around the state. So let's do a quick quiz. And um, let's see. So how does your agency partner with your local AJCC? And so what I want you to do 
Melinda, is this okay if we do it in the chat? The responses? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you can answer with one, two, three, four, five, or um, or uh, let's say you just do student referrals. You just put one in the chat. If you don't know, just put zero. So um, please go into the chat and answer this question. How does your agency partner with your local America's Job Center of California? And you can select the numbers that are appropriate. You can select zero if you have no idea. If you uh, have other, you can put the number five and then with a brief explanation of what that other is. So let's give you a few minutes to post that in the chat and we'll take a look at it and see how you're doing. And I'll kind of narrate as we go. Some people aren't sure. Oh, we've got a lot of responses here. Okay, so let me, uh, let's see. So one to three, so student referrals, training, workshops, registration, intake, all of the above. Some people are referrals and training, referrals and training, registration. One person has shared administrative costs. That's Kelly, that's interesting. We don't really see too many of that. Uh, Janice also has a shared administrative cost. Great. Uh, let's see. And then some people, same thing with um, Carolyn has uh, all four. And then the other people have maybe registration and intake, training. Oh, very good. So um, let's see if there's any uh, others here that we missed. Okay, and then others, uh, this is from Marianne, one of our guest speakers. She has co-enrollments, paid internships, externships, and supportive services. So um, nice to add that in there. Thank you, Marianne. Let's see if, it, and then uh, Ang Angelica has co-located under five, right? Okay, and then Maria didn't explain her five. Sarah is co-located on her other, and Adele, who's our other guest speaker, Apple Valley has an additional MOU as a connection site. Hmm, be interesting to hear about that. All right, so we have some people with shared costs, on-site rep, uh, and scholarships, interesting. All right, wow, that was, uh, that was a lot of sharing going on there. You won't, you wouldn't be surprised if just the numbers you put in there that informed us about what's happening at your uh, local AJCC. I was expecting a lot of not sure or unknown, but a lot of you are familiar with that connection. Um, so that was surprising, but I'm glad, I'm glad you guys are connected. Um, okay, let's move on. See if I can get this slide deck going. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so just a little bit more information on shared customers and services. Uh, the MOU should clearly delineate the responsibilities of each MOU partner. So when we say MOU partners, just not adult education, you will see a lot of other partners, you'll see maybe Department of Social Services at the county level. You could see community-based organizations um, along with community colleges or adult schools. You might also see um, some other local services, nonprofits, things like that. And when we get into the panel discussion, I'm sure they'll have a lot more examples of partners that they work with. Um, so the responsibilities of MOU partner when it comes to helping plan, develop, and implement the local system. So some of the delineation responsibilities that you'll see in a memorandum of understanding are the services you're providing and to whom, uh, the best way to serve the local population um, through effective partnerships, referrals, and cross-training. And a lot of you um, already mentioned that you are working with them and you are doing referrals uh, and probably um, some cross-training there too, if you're co-located. 
um, at, a, at a comprehensive site. So that's great to see. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And then uh, shared costs, and some people mentioned shared costs. So each uh, America's Job Center of California partner that carries out a program or activity within an HECC, meaning on site, must use a portion of their funds available for their program and activities to help maintain the AJCC delivery system, including proportionate payment of inf infrastructure costs of the uh, center. And, and that's specified in the WIOA Act. In fact, if you look at, um, if you're familiar with the grant application, or maybe it's the um, grant yeah, budget. Quick question. Oh, was that was that directed at us? I don't think so. Belinda, was that just an oopsie? I think that was an oopsie, Neil. Going oh. ahead. <laughs> uh, Neil, this, this is Jim. Though you you do have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Do, do you want to? Uh, you and Catherine want to wait until you get to the end to address those? Um. No, we can address them now. I didn't. I wasn't monitoring that. So oh, go sure. ahead, Jim. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, uh, we can we, get to them right now. Okay. We we have one question. Does an MOU include compensation? Compensation, like workers' compensation, or uh, that is from Janice. Maybe uh, Janice, if uh, can you maybe un unmute yourself real quick and maybe just de de lap. Oh, here here we go. She's referring to cost of teachers and sites. Oh, like I that. see. So I was just going to go over this. So oh. according to Wioa you're limited to 5% admin on your shared infrastructure costs. So let's say you have a grant of, um, I don't know, uh, maybe $100,000. So 5% of that, which is $5,000, that's the limit that you can contribute. You can't go over, if you're using WIOA 2 funds, you know, AFLA uh, funds, the literacy funds that, Carolyn and Jim were talking about this morning, you are limited. And if you do go over, you have to get permission or approval from your CDE consultant to go over that 5%. And that 5% not only includes the shared infrastructure costs, but it also includes other administrative costs that you might be taking on object code, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, et cetera. Um, so you have to be careful on your shared costs and you don't go over that 5%. Also, if your administrator is going to conferences and training, that is also part of that 5%. So keep that in mind as you're negotiating those um, that shared costs. And to Janice's question, um, usually it's infrastructure costs going towards the comprehensive site. So the adult school would be paying for space and maybe utilities and whatever shared infrastructure costs are uh, negotiated at that AJCC. It wouldn't be coming back to you as compensation of teachers and supplies and support staff and classified. Uh, it's usually going towards the comprehensive site if that's uh, kind of what you were asking. Yes, Janice responded exactly. Okay, great. All right, that's a good question because, um, yeah, you have to have both eyes open when you go into these partnership relationships and you're establishing an MOU. Um, you are do have some limitations as far as how you're going to pay those shared costs. So just keep in mind that 5% threshold and if you are going to go above it, you should talk to your CD consultant before doing so. Or you could be uh, having some unallowed uh, costs when you do your budget if you didn't get that prior approval. Uh, so you'll see it in the fine print when you do your first, um, um, what is it, expenditure claim report, Q1, which will be coming up for you, I think, next month or the end of this month or something like that you'll see at the bottom, you're restricted to 5% on your admin. And so if you do have admin in your budget, 
it'll keep a running total of how much admin and then uh, it'll keep the percentage so the consultant will see if you're below or above that 5%. And then that will determine, you know, one of the factors in approving your expenditure claim report. So just keep that in mind and maybe have that open line of communication with your CDE consultant. Okay. Okay, uh, our next question, how and who should we contact to get an MOU for Workforce Development Board? Do they have a sample or do we need to create an MOU? No, the, uh, the local Workforce Development Board is the keeper of the MOU and they, they make sure they get all the signatures of all the partners. So it's a requirement. So like I said at the beginning, they're going through a certification process. And so in order to be certified to offer services to the region, they have to make sure they have MOUs with all their partners and the appropriate signatures. So they should have that in fi on file. So what I would do, if you don't have anybody at your site that has connections with the local workforce development board, I would reach out to them, but let's wait. Uh, for the panel discussion, I'm sure Marianne and Adele will have some tips on if you're new to this, what's the best way to reach out to the local workforce development board and start that uh, MOU discussion and negotiation if you choose to maybe take it a step further and maybe be on site or something like that or getting more information. So um, let's revisit that in just a little bit when we bring our panelists on. Okay, we got just a few more. Uh, I'm a bit confused about the difference between an AJCC and a Workforce Investment Board. Okay, so the Workforce Investment Board, which, which is now called the Workforce Development Board, is kind of like the overarching um, governance for the region. Uh, and there's like, I forget how many workforce development boards are there might be like 40 49 45 40, 45. 45 yes oh i was close i was in, almost in the bullseye thank you marianne <laughs> so there's 45 and so they run that and then the america's job center of california they go into a competitive process to see who will offer the services for the local workforce development board and so that local workforce development board and their chief local official or chief elected official will make that decision of who's going to be the local operator or the American Job Center of California operator. And so that's the difference. That AJCC could change quite a bit depending on, you know, what's going on at your local workforce development board. Sometimes you'll have the same provider at the AJCC for a long time. And sometimes they'll go out to bid and you might get a change in that. Um, but we'll um, we'll see what Marianne and Adele have to say about what goes on at the local level and what kind of changes we're seeing there. Or maybe it's just status quo and you're just, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, getting people up to speed, but the same partners have been always been there. So we'll find out about the local, um, you know, flavor what's going on locally that maybe can inform that um, question that you had. Okay. okay. And then uh, next question, shared cost only works one way, correct? So if AJCC staff is at our adult school site, they don't compensate us. We only pay if we are at an AJCC. Well, it depends on if your site is the comprehensive one stop. So I don't know. I think that it depends on the the setup. If you're the comprehensive site, then they would be paying you for infrastructure costs. Um, and I'm not sure how that works with an affiliated site, but if they're having staff located at your site, um, I don't know. I would I would check to see if there is that discussion for infrastructure costs. Um, but I think it, it might only be with the comprehensive site. I'll check uh, maybe Marianne or Adele have a little more information on that uh, shared costs. Does it only go one way to the comprehensive site? Or if you're affiliated and you have co-located staff, 
How does that work? Do you guys have any uh, input into that one? So it, it is one way in that if um, any a, adult education partner is co-located with either an affiliate site or a comprehensive site, then they have to share in the costs. However, it is not required the other way around. So oh, okay. if so, if if um, um, if we are co-located with a partner, then we don't necessarily have to share in the cost. We can, and that can be negotiated, but we're not mandated to do that as opposed to we're mandated to charge if they co-locate with us. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. I believe if you're not co-located, there are no costs. San Bernardino is huge, but we don't have any co-locations with the Title II providers. To, to that end, I would also say that they did discuss with us on the last round of funding what the infrastructure costs might look like. Um, and once they saw the Title III partners saw what Title II partners actually get, they're like, uh, never mind. Because they literally their in, their income is like ten times what ours is for the same kind of uh, you know client face forward hours and that but I think that the cost analysis was very helpful because they understood what we're doing a lot with a little and we're willing to refer everybody to them because it helps both of us. There you go. Great, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Adele. Appreciate that info. Okay. Uh, any uh, any other questions, Jim? Uh, I, I think you already addressed this one, Neil. It's uh, from Michael. Do you have a boilerplate MOU that you could share that we could use as a baseline in our discussions with our local AJCC partner? You know, what I would suggest you do is your CDE regional consultant might have a good example because when we do our um, FPMs, I know we look at you know, a variety of MOUs and we have to see if it meets um, our requirements. And so there might be one they could share or an old one. Um, you might also, somebody at the local workforce development board might have a, a sample or something like that that they could share. There might even be something on maybe one of our websites, but I would check with your CD consultant first um, before you dive into local politics and asking for stuff, and we might be able to help you with that. Okay, I, I think that was it for the actual uh, questions right now. Okay, thank you, Jim. Sure. Okay. And then lastly, service costs are identified, and I kind of went over this uh, in WIOA Section 134, C2, as applicable to each program consisting of career services, individualized career services, and follow-up services. So at the at the AJCC, they delineate the type of services that they're offering. So all that is spelled out in the uh, Workforce uh, Investment and Opportunity Act there. Okay. And then our last quiz, that doesn't mean we're over, but this is our last quiz. So same instructions, just put the number. And if you choose seven, let us know what the other is. But what services do your America's Job Center of California partners provide? So select any of the seven. And if something's not listed there, uh, type in what other is. If you don't know, just put not sure or zero. Whatever works. So, and I'll look at the chat as we get through. Okay. So, some people are just some individual, like job training, services for the disabled. Some people have all six. Some people just have information referrals and job training career guidance, others are all of the above, all of the above, most of it, childcare included. Interesting. So it looks like there's a, um, a lot of services being provided that you're aware of. In some cases, maybe just the job training and career guidance. Some people are unsure. 
Um, some people have very comprehensive sites. I'm just looking for any uh, others that maybe they could uh, extrapolate on. And then Marianne wanted to add difference between workforce development boards and workforce investment boards. The uh, Workforce Investment Board was established under the Workforce Investment Act. And then in 2014, the Workforce Investment Boards became Workforce Development Boards under the new Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA. So if you haven't been around that long, you wouldn't remember the transition from WIOA to, to WIA to WIOA. But thank you, Marianne, for putting that in there. And then Mary Ann lists uh, one of the others is rapid response layoff aversion and a bunch of other things that she doesn't have time for. Yeah, that's part of the Title I funds that go through the local workforce development board is that rapid response. There's a lot of funding that goes through to help off, you know, when plant closures and things like that or um, projects that they're working on to help local employers. So, um well, there's a lot more involved. And then Eric shares uh, his other is tuition for job training programs. And Adele says uh, vouchers or access to technology or devices. And then Alejandra mentions his supportive services such as bus passes. Great. All right. So thank you for sharing again, quite a lot of information there. And let's see, last slide here, I think before we uh, turn it over to Catherine, some other shared services, and I think people mentioned this, we have initial uh, intake, we have identif identification of services, assessment of needs, referrals to other agency partners, and then appraisal of basic skills and business services. And I know the adult schools do a lot of appraising and assessment and identification of appropriate services and initial intake. So um, that's why uh, when Adele was talking about how valuable the uh, um, adult ed providers are in this system, I think the other partners are blown away of, about what we offer and, and how uh, cheap we are <laughs> to what we offer. We don't cost that much. Okay, and then lastly, the, the non-personal costs necessary for physical operation of the HACC, and this would be those infrastructure costs um, that we were talking about. If you're co-located at a site, you would be contributing to rent and maybe utilities or maintenance equipment. And then uh, if there's shared technology, that would also be included. Um, access and accommodation must be included in the budget ensuring physical and programmatic access to the American Job Center of California by individuals with disabilities. And we did notice in the question, a lot of people do have specific services for individuals with disabilities. Uh, so that was nice to see that uh, people are recognizing that as well. Okay, and then uh, lastly, review and updates to the MOU must be reviewed and updated at least every three years. That's part of the certification process that I told you about that the local workforce development boards and their centers are going through right now. I guess the EDD Employment Development Department has a uh, workforce directive out for comment that will give them instructions on how to update their uh, certification. That's every three years. And that would include those MOUs as well. And then the infrastructure cost agreement must be reviewed annually. And also lastly, uh, infrastructure costs can only be paid from funds available. And this is what I talked about earlier, the 5% for local administrative expenses or from non-federal resources that are cash, in-kind, or third party. So if you uh, exceed that 5%, you can always use non-federal resources if you have them available. And you can do in-kind or something like that or third-party contributions or cash. Um, so that's part of that negotiation with your, your partner. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine for the, the remaining slides, and then we'll, we'll open up the panel discussion. Okay, so I'm back. 
<laughs> Can you? So strategic co-enrollment. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor commenced a national work group in order to collaborate on getting a better understanding of co-enrollment strategies. Uh, California participated in the work group and committed to creating a co-enrollment guidance in order to align service delivery with concepts and visions found in WIOA. Um, the WIOA places a strong emphasis on planning and implementation across multiple partner programs to ensure alignment and service delivery. Strategic co-enrollment can increase program on participant success, maximize resources, enable greater efficiencies in service delivery, and align services with regional sector pathways. Uh, this system must serve as an all-inclusive access point to education and employment programs that provide demand-driven skills attainment, especially for those with barriers to employment. Uh, Co-enrollment, co if you, we can go, let's see, am I, did I skip this one? Okay, co-enrollment key concepts. The first one is integrated service delivery. Establish and participate as an integrated system of partners to share common goals with services offered by multiple organizations for a seamless participant experience. The focus is on clients or target groups who have complex needs that require services from multiple partners. Okay. All right, increased access. Ensures any participant, especially individuals with barriers to employment who enter an AJCC have access to partner programs, services and activities where they are eligible, including physical and programmatic access as described in WIOA section 134D. Continuous improvement. Create a delivery system that is focused on process improvement and challenges the status quo. I kind of don't know what that means. <laughs> I think it just means, you know, have an easy system that students find easy and that you find easy in order to help students. Partnership, I mean, I think this is the main point. Align goals, outcomes, and resources with all local partners in the AJCC system to leverage resources to provide a higher quality and level of services. Catherine, I think on the continuous improvement, the local AJCCs and the local workforce development boards also have a SIP process that they have to go through. So they have a continuous improvement program that right. they have to complete every year and have targets like we do for WIOA too. So very similar. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next slide then. Yeah, that makes sense. No, thank you. The goal is a common intake and this reduces the paperwork required for an individual to provide and complete during intake. And it may include authorization to release information that allows partners to share and enter information in their respective case management systems. Streamlines data sharing and supports the tracking of referrals, co-enrollments and outcomes and helps people with multiple barriers access coordinated services. All right, thank okay. you, Catherine. Okay. Now <laughs> my favorite part, you're welcome. All right. So now I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna uh, bring in our two panelists, Adele McLean from Apple Valley Adult and Marianne Pranky from Glendale Community College. And let me stop sharing. So now we're back here all together. And so what we wanted to do with our two panelists is you've heard kind of some of the questions that people have asked. We kind of went through the slide deck, kind of a you know high level overview but the, if there's anything you can offer or add to someone that's just, just starting out or is new to the WIOA 2 grant and you know is a little bit apprehensive about this whole MOU bit and working with their AJCC, uh, maybe just some words, uh, tips and uh, advice that you can offer and uh, that would be great. We'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, I, I'm happy to, to okay. get us started. Okay. <laughs> as far as um, getting started with the MOU, and please do not let the MOU scare you away with this shared cost, because as Adele pointed out, if you're not co-located, there is no shared cost. But even if there is, they always 
the workforce boards will negotiate to try to do what they can to make it as easy as possible and also as lucrative as possible for you, your staff, and, and your students. So um, that that is the goal, is to have the partners involved. Um, they We are, um, as a, a workforce board, and by the way, I'm actually a staff to the workforce board, and I'm also coordinator of the um, adult education program here in Glendale. So we're able to work um, very closely because I wear both hats. So it's easier for me to to move um, students into um, into the AGCC services and the other way around as well. Um, so if you're just starting out, um, I would say that if you are looking at uh, becoming a partner in an MOU, the best place to start is with the executive director of the workforce board and just calling them and talking to them about um, becoming a partner if you're not already. We should have, every workforce board is required to have adult education partner in um, uh, in their MOU. And um, we owe a Title II uh, is also required. So um, it they can have CAPE, for example, and we owe a Title II, but there should be enough representation um, in the MOU. And we're mandated to have that MOU, as Neil pointed out. So if we do not have an MOU executed, then we will not meet our certification. And if we don't meet either one of those, we will not be eligible for funding. So a workforce board, their funding depends on the mandated partners being in place and the certification happening successfully. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, let's hear from Adele. Well, I would say I didn't think of going straight to the executive director. I did when I first started with this. I made sure that both myself and our consortium director went to several um, workforce development boards meetings because I figure we don't know what we're involved in until we know like what's going on at the at the workforce. So once you show up and you show an interest, believe me, they'll start reaching out to you because it's like anything else. It's a coalition of the willing. And if you show up, they figure you're willing because it is a different world. Um, there are different acronyms. I think the biggest hurdle for us is I live in the world of education. So IEP for us means individual education plan for them. It means individual employment plan. Very different things. There's a lot of acronym surfing that you're going to have to do. But um, they know as little about you as you know about them. So the more you show up, the more conversations can be had, the more bridges can be built. That is my, uh, my takeaway from this. I, we don't have a comprehensive at one location center. If you take a look at San Bernardino, we're huge. So we have three AJCCs and I'm in the high desert AJCC where they do have a comprehensive center, but we're not co-located. So you know, we rely on each other for the referral of clients from more from us to them probably than them to us. Although they are realizing that they need us more and more as they realize that the high school diploma and or the HSE is an element. I think it's just um, just having those conversations about what your relative benefit is to each other. And I, with the MOUs, I am a little ignorant throughout the state. My assumption is that there are MOUs in place that they are probably copying language from. And they're probably public access somewhere. I know I do a lot of searching on our county websites to find out what's going on. You can get on all kinds of emails from the Workforce Development Board and they'll send you basically meetings and uh, agendas and meeting notes and You'll find out what's going on all over the place if you start getting on their mailing list and show up to their meetings. I think uh, in a lot of areas, there's only four a year, so <laughs> small room. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Adele. And um, let's pause there to see if anybody has any questions. You can either type them. What, Jim or Melinda, what would be the appropriate way for people to ask questions? Put it in the Q&A or do you want them to come off mic or what would be appropriate? Um, I, I think we've been wanting as much as possible for people to use the uh, Q&A. Uh, Melinda can correct me if that's uh, not correct. 
it helps with video production not to have too many voices. So, uh, yes, okay. the Q and A would be, and and it gives you all a chance to practice your typing skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if anybody has uh, Q and A or questions, and we'll provide the A. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to think of some questions that you want to ask, and I'll and I'll let's see. I'll ask Marianne and Adele a question. Let's see. So, um, as far so, neither of you are providing infrastructure costs to your uh, AJCC because you're like Adele said, you are affiliated, but you're not at the comprehensive site. But Marianne, it sounds like you're co-located at the comprehensive site, correct? Okay. Yes, I am. And how we get around the using our CAPE funds um, for a, a cost sharing is that I'm also workforce board staff. So because I'm workforce board staff, we don't actually um, contribute to the infrastructure in that way. So okay. if we... If we did, for example, we were holding ESL classes here before the pandemic. And so we had um, we had an entire room um, that we used on a daily basis and we provided access to the computers for all the students and access to our, our printer for the instructor and access to technology and so forth. So in that case, um, we receive an allocation of CAPE funds um, that we use to cover the cost of my coordination and staffing and so forth. And so we used a portion of that allocation that we received from Glendale Community College under a contract. We use that to cover the um, the the sharing costs. It was um, basically like a lease cost. Okay, great. And I know which one of you, or maybe both of you participated I think a few years ago we had some pilots on co-located co-location between um, you know putting students or clients into Cal Jobs and also uh, putting that information into Tops Pro. Were yes. any of I think Marianne you were involved in that Adele were you involved in that effort? Um, my school just as a practice we've always put students into Cal jobs and had them register with CCC apply. And we don't do it as part of any prescriptive service. We just thought it was a really good idea because then if you're at the AJCC, we can use some very simple data points to see if we're talking about the same person. Just name, you know, birth date, you know what I mean? So that we can say, oh yes, we did send, you know, Bob Smith over there and <laughs> And do some some kind of follow up because uh, that does become a little bit difficult. Right. And Marianne, what's your experience in that uh, co enrollment field? So we do a lot of co enrollment, and and we're very purposeful about that because um, first and foremost, from the the Cape side, uh, when they're co enrolled in WIOA one. Um, we, we owe a Title I, the AGCC people, they're very good at getting that social security number. Um, in particular, if they're going to be uh, doing a paid externship or a paid internship for the student, um, then the student is motivated to give them their social security number because they're going to be on payroll. Um, so once we get that information on the Title I side, then they give me the information so that I could enter it into TOPS Pro. And so we're able to get those social security numbers into TOPS Pro so that we can track from both sides the, the base wage data. And so even if, if we lose track of them, we can still see if they're employed or not. Um, so we, we also use a lot of the co-enrollments um, just to add services to our students. So for example, almost all of our students that are in some type of career technical education um, we work with the AJCC, the AJCC can even come on site or even through Zoom, be able to outreach to the students and co-enroll them so they can um, participate in either paid internships or paid externships. And they're on the payroll for the for Duco Workforce Board while they participate in that. The other thing that we did was um, during the pandemic, um, that 
gave us so many good ideas because the workforce board had um, received so many emergency grants and they could provide supportive services. And we were losing students left and right because um, their children were at home. And so they didn't have childcare and they weren't at school. And many of them, especially our ESL students, used to come to class during the time that their kids were in school. Um, but we were able to keep some of the students because uh, we worked with our AJCC and our AJCC provided supportive services and reimbursed them for everything from utility costs to insurance costs to um, housing costs, childcare, um, was reimbursing them for all of these expenses so that they could stay in, uh, continue participating in their courses, whether it was ESL or whether it was a uh, uh, you know, medical assistant program to get them to finish their programs. But they um, required that the students, in order to be eligible for all of these reimbursements, they had to remain in school. They had to remain in our programs and that's how we were able to retain them. So now we're looking at using stipends again to motivate some of our students to complete their programs in particular basic education, for example, um, or the, the HSE, for example, we want them to finish that. And so we're gonna try to use stipends for that. Um, we can also use stipends to cover um, expenses for books, supplies, um, and other related fees. Um, parking fees, if there are any, they would cover that. So. Great. Hey, uh, Neil, uh, we, we are up to five questions and we're, I think we're pushing up against the clock. So okay. uh, should we try Let to me, get as many of those yeah. as we can? Okay. Let me, um, uh, I can go with the first question. So um, let's see either, let, let's take turns. Maybe Adele, you do the first one and then Marianne does the second one. So first question is based on what I understand, starting the conversation with the executive director find a convenient time from their calendar, convince them to sign the MOU with us, certify us. If not impossible, it would be a um, time-consuming task. By the end of October, we should submit our report. How can we accomplish that goal? Is there any referral we can request from CDE to those local workforce development boards? I don't think it's as complex. Adele, any tips on that? I would say they're gonna be reaching out to you to get the signature because they need your signature. I don't think that you're going to have to reach out to them, but this has been my experience. I'm in a more rural type area. I, I'll i ask uh, Marianne if she has any other input on that. I don't think it's incumbent upon us to do anything with the MOU other than being the recipient. I've never seen it where we are constructing the MOU. We're a part of it, but we're not writing it from scratch. Okay. Neil, oh, I'm going correct. to interrupt just for a second. Adele, please um, turn off your video. We're getting some drop packets from you, and this is going to help save you in the room. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Then we have another question, and maybe this is uh, whoever knows the area. How can I find out which AJCC to reach? I'm in Joshua Tree, which I think is San Bernardino County. And some say call Indio, some say call San Bernardino. Should I wait for them to contact me or should I just go ahead and contact them? Any suggestions, either of you? I don't think Joshua Tree's in San Bernardino. I think it's in Inyo. Oh, okay. So maybe 10, I'm thinking maybe what's that, a thousand palms or whatever that one is. No, I think it is San Bernardino. I was just there. Joshua Tree is in San Bernardino country, County, yes. I think so. Okay. Yes, I was just there. That's That was my question, who wrote it. And yes, we are in Joshua Tree, which is San Bernardino County. I didn't know if we only reached out to our given county. I think uh, you have to, right? I yes, would recommend they, that you do. If it's San Bernardino County, then they will be reaching out to you. But I promise you, since you're on here, if you'll, um, I can send you whatever has been sent to me. We haven't gotten anything yet. And I can send you the contact information for our one-stop operator. Thank and you. she'll make sure to loop you in. So I'll just, uh, 
maybe put your email in the chat or maybe uh, Adele will put her email in the chat. I'll put okay. it now. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, next question, what if students do not want to share their social security number? Um, so first of all, let me just say that it really helps when there is a an incentive, which is to participate in, um, in a paid work experience. Um, so honestly, our AGCCs just do not have difficulty getting social security numbers. Um, they know that they're gonna go into a paid position. So they, they have no problem doing that. Um, there's very, very few who have a right to work and have a social security number that would not give it to an AJCC. So they, they, they really don't have that problem. If there is someone who does not want to provide it, then the AJCC can still um, enroll them and issue a um, pseudo number. Um, so they can do that, but they still have to verify right to work. Um, now, and there's another question about right to work as well. There are certain services that you do not need a social security number, you do not need right to work. Um, and those are all of the um, career guidance, the um, career counseling, those, ty those types of services, workshops, all of those that would be um, free to anybody um, off the street. There's no eligibility requirement for that. However, if they're going to go into on-the-job training, they want job placement assistance, they're going to go into a, an apprenticeship or externship or internship, anything that requires them to be on payroll or will require them to be on payroll, such as job placement, then yes, they do need to have right to work. And they still don't have to give us a social security number. Um, we can issue a pseudo number, but we would have to verify right to work. But again, we're going to do whatever we can to encourage them to give us that social security number because we can't track employment unless we have that. All right. Thanks, Marianne. Last question. Um, so sorry if anybody else had other questions. It's Suzanne. He says, we are entering an MOU with our local Workforce Development Board, but it is just the two organizations. The Workforce Development Board will be for providing guest speakers, field trips, internships, and help with resumes. We, the adult school, is pay are paying for these services. Is this similar to what you are presenting, even though there are no other partners on our agreement. Mm. Well, there are some mandatory partners that have to be in that MOU. So uh, uh, maybe this is a different type of agreement. I don't know, Marianne or Adele, what do you think? This could be just a basic MOU, which is different than the AJCC MOU, possibly. It might be, it might be different. Um, the WUDAB is providing, seems to be providing all of the services, but the adult school is paying for them. Yeah, Suzanne, if you wanna come off mute, maybe. I think with a, 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 an umbrella MOU related to an AJCC, you're going to see all the other partners. You will see all their signatures. They are mandated. So I don't think what you're describing is the uh, MOU that we would be looking at during a federal program monitoring review for compliance. It sounds like that might be another type of agreement outside of the AJCC MOU. So I would double check that, Suzanne, if you could. With uh, who do I check it with? I. Uh, I mean, you could talk to your local workforce development board. Um, you could talk to your CD, CDE consultant to see if it passes, you know, federal program monitor compliance. Um, or, you know, locally just talk to your, um, your local workforce development board. The local workforce development board is who I am entering this agreement with. <laughs> Okay. It, just ask them, is this the official AJCC MOU 
um, because, you know, you just tell them you're a WIOA two, you know, a literacy provider, seeing, receiving federal funds, and that you are required to have an MOU uh, with the AJCC. Is this the one that I'm entering into or is this something else? And I would like to see all the mandatory partners as part of that MOU. I don't know if Marianne or Adele have any other advice. The only other thing I could think of it being is some kind of connection site MOU. But if she wanted to email me, I put my email in the chat. I would be happy to share both my AJCC MOU and the connection site MOU. So you could, you know, compare language to I'm, I'm a sharer. Anything I can <laughs> share that would help you, I totally will. All right. All right. We're at time. I, I really appreciate, so thank you, Catherine, my co-presenter, and Marianne and Adele. Thank you so much for the insight and the local knowledge. It's been invaluable. And so uh, we'd love to have you back anytime we're talking about MOUs.